مشنا عملاخ مريم ملية في طيبوثة نارا العملاخ مريخات المشي ومور راخ بير تخرسي غيشو ناط مريم يلي تقالها صلح لابين حطاه هاشا وشاق الموثين آمين My name is Father Orlando Montes de Oca. I'm a Cuban. I belong to the Archdiocese of Camegue. I've been here in Rome for the last two years studying communications at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. I still have one more year before I finish my studies. <laughs> Concerning the situation of the church in Cuba, its confrontation with Marxism that was imposed on us at the beginning of the revolution, we're talking here about 1959, there are a lot of stories that can be told. Yet the most important story is the story of how the Lord works in His church, whatever the situation may be, and what the church learns from these difficult situations. And this has been a very difficult situation indeed. And the path that she opens up thanks to her endeavor to be faithful. The story of the church in Cuba is a story of a church that has chosen to remain faithful in the midst of persecution and suffering. These past 60 years have been very difficult. Many priests have been expelled. It began by taking over many, rather, all the Catholic schools. Many, many religious men and women and priests were expelled from the island, some of whom could never return again, although they were Cuban citizens. Ah, 1965 and 66 were very difficult years. These were terrible times. During that time also, they took over the seminary in Havana. These were very difficult years in which it seemed like the church in Cuba was going to disappear. Yet, in the midst of these difficulties, the Holy Spirit who never abandons the church, especially when the church continues to pray and plead and is determined to remain faithful, raised up many great men and women, now an example of great bishops. I call to mind Monsignor Pedro Maris Estiu, the Archbishop of Santiago in Cuba, and Monsignor Adolfo Rodriguez Herrera, who afterwards was the Archbishop of Camagüe for 40 years. He was a bishop. He was a giant with respect to his faith and trust in the Lord. His motto in life was, it is good to trust in the Lord. He was an extremely positive man, a man who, in the midst of the storm, was able to see the light. There were many lay people also that decided to remain in Cuba. There were families, many families that decided to stay in Cuba despite the dangers and threats involved. And these people decided to remain in Cuba so that the church in Cuba would not become extinct and that it might continue to have catechesis to teach the children and youth. In order to maintain the communities, the lay people took over the responsibility of the vacant churches that had no priests, and they took care of them and protected them and continued to preach the gospel, especially in those years when the church underwent many difficulties. The Holy Spirit raised up in the church many prophets, faithful men and women who embraced our crucified Lord, who knew how to suffer when needed, and who remained there and were a sign of fidelity to the Lord. In Cuba, there is a communist regime that does not permit certain rights that we have, for example, in the Western world. Rights that appear in the Declaration of Human Rights, but that are not taken into account in Cuba. So the people there are deprived of many important rights. For example, the right of parents to educate their children according to their conscience. In Cuba, the education curriculum is based on Marxism, that's to say, on atheism. And although the state has been declared a secular state, 
the education is still Marxist. So you can continue to go to mass and everything else, but you are obliged to educate your children in Marxist ideologies. There is also an article in the Constitution that guarantees religious liberty, yet in the very same Constitution, there are other articles that exclude the possibility of anything that goes against the interests of communism. And of course, this causes tensions. Besides these rights, there are other rights that have been completely silenced. Cubans don't have the right to own enterprises. Now, there are some insignificant businesses, but their possibilities are very limited. And this was only permitted because of certain historical circumstances which had nothing to do with granting rights to the people. It was permitted within certain limits. Asumido sino por una coyuntura histórica, pues se permitieron, pero también con muchas limitaciones. The case is that in Cuba it is easier for foreigners to do business than for the native, and this is a problem. It is a serious lack of liberty. The right to create associations is another right, and there is room for many associations in Cuba, and some do already exist. But they're illegal because the government does not recognize the right to form associations. There's just one political party and that's it. But in reality, it's not a party, so to speak. It's all there is. It, it is totality. Another difficulty is the lack of access to mass media. The mass media belongs to the communist government and it is at the service of the communist party. There is no freedom of thought. The journalists are all the same, they're all of the same ideology, and those that try to do anything different, independent journalists, are severely punished when they're sentenced to jail for a time or are heavily sanctioned, because according to the law in Cuba, this is a serious offense. The church is not given access to the mass media on a permanent basis. Some permissions have been granted, spontaneous, but not permanent access. So this is a right we are deprived of. We have the right to speak to society, to contribute to the good of society by way of the gospel. Another obstacle for the church's evangelization is the lack of liberty to build churches and places for worship. Recently, two or three modest churches have been built in Cuba after a long wait, but it took a lot of patience and a lot of insisting. Now we should be given the freedom to do this without obstacles, because these constructions are of no harm to society whatsoever. But as it stands, we are impeded to do so. For a long time also, we could not receive missionaries from outside the country. Now the situation is that for a missionary to come, a petition has to be made. And to begin with, the permission is on a short-term basis. It is a long process before permanent permission is granted. They don't grant permission straightly away to missionaries that come to Cuba. They have to pass through various controls. Living the faith in Cuba continues to be difficult at times. Some years back, it was extremely difficult. Today, it's complex. It's a complicated theme because although the law recognizes Christians and is supposed to protect them, in reality, there are many situations where they see themselves restrained and are victims of discrimination because of their belief. They are not truly free. Se ven presionados desde muchos desde muchos lugares, desde muchas dimensiones por ser cristiano. No es absolutamente libre. El hecho de que la iglesia en Cuba haya tenido tantas limitaciones no es lo más importante. The fact that the church in Cuba has been very restrained is not the most important thing. What is important is that which the church has been able to do in the midst of these limitations and what the Spirit has worked through her. 
We haven't been able to build churches. We haven't been able to build a place for the Lord, for prayer, etc. But this has not stopped the church. The church in Cuba, when the revolution took over, some 60 years ago, it was, there was a population of 6 million. But now that we are more than 11 million, there are many new communities that do not have churches. This does not hinder us. It's a good thing. The church in Cuba continues forward, continues to carry out her mission. We can't use the radio or the television to gather the people, so we go door to door. We knock at the doors and we proclaim the gospel. Normally in the neighborhoods, some of the families open their doors and the community begins to gather in their homes. A mission house is established. This is a blessing for the church in Cuba. These are churches without bell towers, as we call them. In these mission houses, the faith is celebrated the same as in parishes. I have celebrated many masses in the dining room of many houses. It is very beautiful to celebrate the faith in the midst of a family. And that family opens its doors to many other people. And there also the sacraments are celebrated and catechism is taught. There, we give formation to the adults, missionary houses. Of course, the ideal thing would be to have churches and the people ask for this in prayer. In the prayers of the faithful at Mass, they pray for the liberty to have a place of worship in their neighborhood, in their towns. And while they wait, they keep moving forward. This does not stop them. They continue forward, living their faith and evangelizing. The church in Cuba, as I said before, does not have free access to the mass media as it should be allowed to. It is a limitation, a poverty for the church, and especially for society. Although the church's voice is not heard in the mass media, this does not hold her back. We have parish and diocesan bulletins and magazines. In the parish offices and in the diocesan offices, magazines are made and distributed, and the people really long to receive them. It is mainly the laity who make them, and they do so in their free time. They work hard to do this in their free time, outdoing themselves in generosity. Now, there are many other initiatives. A group of young people record programs on DVDs at their parishes and then hand them out. These also are very welcomed by the people because it is a different message from what they are used to hearing and does not do any harm to anyone although technically speaking, it is not allowed. The lack of access to the mass media does not discourage the church. Lack of access to the education system is another barrier for the church in Cuba. This is a problem because Christian children, the new generation, grow up without any gospel values whatsoever. And we know that if God is taken away, if Jesus Christ is taken away, man is defenseless. Without Christ, we lack so many values that we need to live a dignified life. There's no one who can dignify us like Christ can. He makes us live our dignity to the full. For this reason, the church does not draw back when faced with these difficulties. Various educational groups have been set up in parish halls and in places that we have here and there. They offer foreign languages and after-school reinforcement classes. They offer many different types of courses. There are courses for small business owners to teach them how to manage their small business, following specific moral values and techniques. These courses and many others help them prosper in their businesses. Now, although these initiatives are not always welcomed by the government, they are in fact very welcomed by the people because they offer alternatives and they are necessary. They don't harm anybody. On the contrary, they contribute to society and are very beautiful in the way in which the church commits herself to serve the people. In addition to these, there has been another initiative that is called the nurseries. Some of the first began in Havana some years ago. And sometime after, more were started up in other places because there's a real need for them in the Cuban society. It offers excellent human formation beginning from an early age. Again, the church has many limitations, but it is not held back by these limitations.
The church's motivation, which overcomes these limitations, is the gospel and fidelity to Jesus Christ. It is a church that is creative, positive, joyful, and that continues forward with her mission. With respect to possible reforms in Cuba, now that there is a new president in the government council, no, no, there are no reforms made in Cuba. The long-awaited political changes, liberty, etc., they have not happened. And we are not to expect any changes from the Communist Party, because the Communist Party has repeatedly stated that no changes will be made. They have made this very clear. And quoting their very words, our new president had made it very clear even before he was appointed. Things continue as they were. And as Raul Castro continues as the head of the Communist Party, it is he who in reality rules. He rules also the military, which is the strength behind the whole system. So there aren't any changes at all. The only desire, the only objective they have is fidelity to the historical process and to the ideas of Fidel Castro. This is the only goal that they have. Therefore, there is no chance of change. For a young Christian in Cuba, it is not easy at all. Especially because as they live in a country that lacks the most basic things, they often give in to despair. One of the greatest threats to our Cuban society is that of despair. The situation is so rigid, the political and economic situation, that sometimes it can give the impression that it is never going to change. There's a saying that the people use when they want to refer to the government. They don't speak directly about it because this can cause problems. In Cuba they say, this thing, nobody can fix it. There's no solution for it. Deep down, it speaks of resignation and despair. And this happens to many young people. They feel that there's no future for them in Cuba. They look forward and see nothing. They don't believe themselves capable of bringing about any changes. And they try to resolve their problem in the problem. And they end up escaping many, many of them from the island. They flee and make their own future. And they have the right to do so, to do something different, to have a family in a stable economic situation and help their relations that remain behind on the island. But the result is that the society loses its youth, and this is a great loss. One of the greatest losses that the Cuban society is undergoing. The Pope said it to them. Take courage, keep committed. The youth need to faithfully commit themselves to take up the task of creating new structures. The Pope invites them to be heroic in this way, to remain faithful, to change the things from the inside out and so to make the island, which suffers so much, a more human society. And as far as encouraging the youth to assist the World Youth Day, it is not an easy task. In fact, a large number will assist this upcoming World Youth Day thanks to the generosity of fellow Christians in other countries because the number from Cuba is symbolic. There are no means because the people are in great need, because there's a lack of food, there is high inflation and the salaries are extremely low. No Cuban with the income they receive can travel freely, not even within the island itself. To make a journey within the island, one has to consider it carefully before going. Yet these young people can make it there thanks to the support from other countries, for which we are very grateful and sure that the Lord will reward them for this. And also there are sometimes limitations imposed when it comes to traveling. It usually has to do with ideologies, 
For example, when a young person declares himself to be against the communist regime, because that is what he believes, and he has a right to do so as he pleases, he cannot be forced to think otherwise. So when a person says that he thinks differently, straight away the doors are closed for that person. Many times, even to travel, he encounters difficulties. It's not easy for him to travel or to do any other things that are essential in his life. Para viajar y para otras muchas cosas todavía más elementales, más de la vida diaria. La Virgen María, Our Lady. Yo escuché al Papa Francisco en la audiencia que. I heard Pope Francis in the audience that he had with the Sean Step movement say that it is the virgin who saves the child and goes with him into the desert when the dragon tries to devour him. When I heard the Pope say this, I said to myself, that is Cuba. When all the powers closed their doors to the church, when the church in Cuba was thought to be disappearing because there were no signs of growth, it was declining. At the very time when the dragon was threatening to uproot the faith in the hearts of the Cuban people, the grandmothers continued to teach us that the mother of Cubans was Our Lady of Charity, and the people continued to love Our Lady. They continued to pray to her. They continued to hide the image of Our Lady in their wallets. Perhaps they have had to take the image out of their living rooms or hide it behind the door of their closet. But every day when they opened the door of their closet, Our Lady was there. The Cuban people truly love Our Lady of Charity. The experience that I have had in Cuba as a young priest, the most powerful one, has been the pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Charity in 2010. When the statue of Our Lady came to my parish, 11,000 people came out into the streets to receive her and it was a parish that had only a hundred parishioners at Sunday Mass. We announced the event from door to door. It was an opportunity for me to visit all the houses in our parish area. Months beforehand, we went door to door telling the people that the statue of Our Lady of Charity was going to come, and the people could hardly believe what they were hearing. But is this true? And I heard them say, she is my mother. I have always believed in her. She has helped me so much, the typical stories of what Our Lady does for us. And that day, there were 11,000 people beholding Our Lady of Charity. I vividly remember the stand with the beautiful image of Our Lady. We celebrated the Liturgy of the Word because these people were not ready for a Mass. We did, however, celebrate the Mass in the church. The Liturgy of the Word took place in the square. Now the bishop was at my side. And between him and myself, we led the time of prayer. And at a certain moment, I had the boldness to say, let's have some silence now. Our Lady is the mother of silence, because the Lord spoke to her in the silence of her heart. And in those moments of silence, I was asking Our Lady to speak to these, her sons, to her people. So this is what I asked the people to do. Let us take a moment to be silent, to make real silence because it is for her. We are going to look at her, but moreover, we want her to look at us and speak to us. Then there was total silence. A square of 11,000 people, and at the end, the very end, a baby began to cry. It was a very beautiful moment. The Cuban people really love Our Lady of Charity, and Our Lady of Charity does so much for the Cuban people more than we can imagine. It is she who has saved the faith in Cuba. And when people enter the church, they go straight to the altar of Our Lady of Charity. And when there's a missionary priest there, the missionary explains who Our Lady is, and the people listen attentively. They take great interest in Our Mother. And many, many of those who are leaders of the communities that have no churches, and those who do apostolate, are people who have come to the faith thanks to their devotion to Our Lady of Charity. Our Lady has brought them. Our Lady always brings us to Jesus and protects us from the dragon. She is the greatest treasure that the Church has in Cuba.
Adolfo Rodríguez, este titán. Monsignor Adolfo Rodríguez, this giant of the Church of Cuba, taught us many things. Yet among the things that have marked us the most, all those who knew him well, Monsignor Adolfo always said, a church without a cross is a cross for the church. The cross is the backspine of each Christian and of the church. The cross can take the form of an ideology that does not understand us and sees us as a threat and although this is not the case, seeks to persecute us directly or in roundabout ways. Now, the cross can also take other forms. There can be other persecutions, cultural persecutions that are very subtle and that are put into force to try to uproot the gospel from our hearts and from society. In the midst of these difficulties, in the midst of contradictions, which is our lot, we should not be surprised by this contradiction between the gospel and the world. We have to be faithful to the Lord. We have to look at Him and not be distracted. We have to strive to be creative when it comes to proclaiming the faith. These new times require new means. What we defend is not the means, it is the gospel. So we have to be creative. And we can only be creative when we are open to the Holy Spirit. We should not be afraid of persecutions or difficulties or contradictions. On the contrary, we should fear infidelity. Infidelity is the real poverty at stake here. It is what separates us from the Lord who is our true treasure. So, in whatever form it takes, subtle or direct, we must unite ourselves to the Lord and place ourselves under Our Lady's protection, holding on tightly to Our Lady and to what Monsignor Adolfo said, trust. It is good to trust in the Lord. Y aquello que también decía Monseñor Adolfo, confiar. Es bueno confiar en el Señor.